Good morning, church. Are you happy? Yeah, I'm happy too. It's good to see this. Whether you are here or whether you're online, welcome. And uh, like Pastor Mokwan said, we are starting a new series and it's called The Mystery of Marriage. You know, I believe God wants to build, strengthen and heal marriages. Because we see what is happening around us. You know, the institution of marriage It's very misunderstood or not understood at all. And that's why we see a lot of problems around us today. And that's what we are doing in this series. We want you to go back to understand the design of marriage, which is God's idea. So we've got to go back to the Bible. I know there's a lot of talks, a lot of videos, a lot of seminars, a lot of books, a lot of different speakers. They talk about marriage. But let us not just look at popular opinion. Let us not just, you know, look at what's culturally acceptable. Let us go back to the Bible and see what God says. Because the, you know, the marriage relationship is very important. We know that healthy families or healthy society, for a society to be healthy, you've got to have healthy families. Right? And for our family to be healthy, you got to have a healthy marriage. And that's why we're going to go into the Word of God today. And the first one we're looking at today is roles and responsibilities. And basically, we are answering the question, what does it mean to be a man? And what does it mean to be a woman? Actually, you know, if you're familiar with the Bible, the first book of the Bible is Genesis. And actually, Genesis 1 tells us our equality as men and women. Genesis 2 tells us the differences between men and women. And Genesis 3 tells us that we are both responsible to God. So we're going to look in this, you know, look at this in detail. We're going to go through a lot of scriptures. You might know it already, but if you do not, we have it up on the screen, okay? So let's dwell into the Word of God. Genesis 1, 26 to 28. It says this, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on earth. So God created man in his image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Now, from this scripture, we know this is God's ideal. That was his original creation. What is it? Five things. One, we are made in God's image. Look at the person next to you and say, you are made in God's image. And secondly, he created male and female. Okay? Look at yourself. Male or female? Female. Okay? And there's males at the back. Hallelujah. Okay? And thirdly, they are both given the authority to rule over the rest of creation. They are to rule over creation. Number four, they are both blessed by God. Not one more than the other, but they are both blessed. Number five, they were both called to be fruitful and multiply. Now, you can see in God's creation, number one, we are made in God's image. That means one is not superior than the other. One is not greater and one is not lesser. We are both equal in value, in worth and dignity. Amen? We are created equal. And, you know, Paul in Galatians 3.28, Galatians 3.28, very clearly he says this, There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. What is Paul saying? You know, you've got to appreciate this. Because when Paul said this, he was speaking to a generation, to a culture that, was, that had all kinds of division, 
class division, age division, gender division, uh, uh, race division. So he, he, what he said was very, very radical. It must have shook them. They don't understand. But he's saying all people, regardless of gender, age, social status, in Christ, we are all equal. We are God's creation. Amen? Now, even though we are equal, but it does not mean we are the same. Sometimes we think equality it equals similarity. We are supposed to be the same. No, we are equal, but we are not the same. Equality doesn't mean similarity. Equality doesn't mean uniformity. Otherwise, God would have just made male, male, right? But no, we are different. We are equal, but we are different. Not only physically. I know, you know, children, they learn this very young, that male and female, they are different biologically. But no, it doesn't, not, not only just that. In Genesis 2, it tells us this, the difference between man and woman. Genesis 2 is quite long, but I'm just going to skip through some of them. Verse 7, then the Lord God formed the man out of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils and the breath of life. And the man became a living creature. Then we jump to 15. It says this, The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it. He's supposed to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. So God gave Adam directly the command. Adam was created first, right, to work the garden and warn concerning the forbidden tree. And then verse 18, then the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man and while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Verse 24, therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh and the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed now from this part of the scripture we see Eve is the helper she's taken from Adam's side and she was named by Adam but Adam is the head Eve is the helper now we must understand this when we mention the word helper which in the Old Testament is Isa, it does not mean inferior. It does not mean they are second rated. It doesn't mean they are second rank. Helper doesn't mean that. Because if you look in the Old Testament, the word helper many a times is used to reference to God. Remember in Psalms 54, Psalms 33, Psalms 70, a lot of it says, oh God, you are my help. God is my helper. He is our help and our shield. Does, mean, does that mean God is inferior? No. So helper doesn't mean that, you know, they are inferior or second rated or second best. It does not mean that. But Eve is the helper. Neither does helper mean dependence, that we are dependent on the other. No. You know, God created Adam first, but it doesn't say anything about being dependent. Actually, God made man and woman to be interdependent. In uh, 1 Corinthians 11, 11, 12, it says this, Nevertheless, in the Lord, woman is not independent of man, nor man of woman. So we're not, we're not dependent, but rather we are interdependent. But even though we are made interdependent, but it does say the woman was made for man. In 1 Corinthians 11, verses 8 to 9, For man was not made from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. So what does that mean if we put this all together? It means the woman is his helper 
created for man. She is the helper fit for him to partner, to complement, to support Adam, to fulfill God's call in their lives. She is not his servant. She is not his property. She is not his prize. But rather, they are to work side by side so that together they can fulfill God's calling in that marriage. That's what it means to be helper. But even though it is one of mutuality, but it is true, Adam is still the head. And what does it mean to be the head? He is to be the protector and the provider. He has responsibility to her, to Eve, and also to God. Okay? So, you know, what does that mean, to be responsible to her? It means that he has her as his first and foremost affection. He has her uh, desires or her benefit in his heart. He, walks, he works for her good. It doesn't mean to rule over or to control her. To be head means he takes responsibility and accountability for this marriage and the family. That's what it means. It's not about who goes to work or who earns more money. It's not about, you know, who does the housework. No, they are roles. They are just duties. And it can be different in every family. For instance, in my family, um, my daughter, one of them in charge of mopping, okay, because she does it well. And then another daughter, she does the dishes. She's very detailed. So she, does, she has these abilities. And for me, I'm the accountant. I take care of the finances, okay? But it doesn't mean I'm the head. No, my husband, he's still the head. He has final say. We talk, we discuss. He gives me direction for the family. He tells me, you know, we talk about it and see how it works. We work together, but he still has final say. He is still the protector, and he protects his family. If something happens, he comes up front first. In Chinese, we say, ah, right? The one that comes first, die first, right? He said, yeah, that was, I talked because I talked to him about this. I said, well, so what does it mean to you? And he said, yeah, that's what it means. I come out first, I die first. And he lays himself down for the family. Because for instance, I'm the finance person, right? So if I find this month we are short, because we want to do something, you know, we are short, we are tight. He would be the first one to sacrifice his allowance. <laughs> and that's what it means to be head, to be head, to direct a family, to protect, to provide. But it doesn't mean, you know, who goes out to work, who does the housework. No, no, they are, they are just duties and different abilities, because we are all different. And it can look different in every family, but still, Adam, the man, is the head. In Genesis 2, that's what it shows. The man is the leader of the relationship from the very beginning. And that was how it was supposed to be before the fall. Because you know what happened. You know, in the fall, all that reversed. Uh, we need to keep the divine order in marriage to be blessed. That's God's ideal. But what happened in Genesis 3? Let us have a look. Sin entered into the world. Even though we are equal, but we have different abilities and activities. But at the same time, different responsibility and accountability to God. Okay, so then chapter 3, Genesis 3, 1 to 19. This is long, okay? Now, the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. Say with me, crafty. Because we're going to talk about that, okay? He said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the tree of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, you shall not eat 
of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. But God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And now in verse 6, so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her. And he ate. Say with me, he ate. Then the eyes of both were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and make themselves loincloths. And then uh, verse 8, and they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of God among the trees of the garden. And Lord God called to the man, to the man, and said to him, where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. Verse 11, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman whom you gave to me to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. And then the punishment comes, right? He tells of the serpent. We skip that. We jump to um, the woman. To the woman, God said, Verse 16, verse 16, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing in pain, and you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. And to Adam he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. And then it goes on and then, you know, we, you know what happens. Now notice this. The serpent approached who? Eve, the woman. The serpent approached Eve and not Adam. Did we say the serpent was crafty? Yes, he's crafty. Because what he tried to do was he reversed God's order. Eve is not the head. Adam is the head. But the serpent devil, Satan, is crafty. What he did was he reversed the order. He tempted her to challenge her, the divine order. He approached the helper, not the head. And then Eve is deceived and she sinned first. But even though Eve sinned first, Adam sinned deliberately. Remember the command not to eat of that fruit was given to Adam. So Adam wasn't deceived. He sinned deliberately. Look at 1 Timothy 2, 13 to 14. That's why it says, for Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived. That's what it means. Adam was the head, but he didn't act as head. Eve was the helper. She tried to act as head, but she wasn't very wise. Adam tried to act as helper, and he wasn't very wise. So Adam received the command directly, but he sinned anyway. And you know what? Satan tried to deceive them, tried to be crafty, but God is very clear about the responsibilities. Because when he approached them, who did he approach first? He said to the man, where are you, Adam? Where are you, Adam? The devil tries to reverse the order, but God knows. He is very clear about the responsibilities. And this is where Adam failed. He didn't act as head, and that also included obeying his wife. He listened to the voice of your wife, of the wife. Now, listen carefully, men out there. I'm not saying you don't listen to your wife, but I think the core of the problem was he failed to exercise headship. He failed to intervene when he could have. So who was held responsible? Adam was held responsible. And you know what? His response revealed 
his failed leadership, actually. Because when God asked him, he gave him a chance, you know, God asked him. And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit and I ate. He should have listened to God first. Now, I'm not saying don't listen to your wife. Your wife has very wise, can be very wise too. They are clever. They have their ideas. But I'm not saying don't listen to your wife, but listen to God first. That is the most important. You know, ladies, as a wife, we encourage our husbands to listen to God. Don't make it about yourselves. You know, a lot of the times we tell husbands our ideas and opinions about ourselves, right? No, we should encourage them to listen to God, be a supporter, be of his help, because he does. He needs our help. Assist him so that he can fulfill God's mandate in his life. You know, it's, it's not a good sign when the wife takes control and headship in the family. It, it never ends well. We have seen many marriages, and this was the first breakdown of marriage, and it broke everything. You know, imagine if he took responsibility. Maybe it could have been different, because if you look in the New Testament, remember the prodigal son? He repented, right? He, he said, Father, I have sinned against heaven, and before you, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And what happened when he returned to the father? He was completely reinstated, more than ever before, right? And in, in Romans 5.12, it says this, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, just as sin came into the world through one man, it doesn't say two people, it doesn't say two people. It says one man. So Adam was held responsible. He did not act as head. They both sinned and they were both punished. But they were both punished according to their responsibilities. Look at this. Adam, he was punished, right? And it says ground was cursed and he has painful toil. He has to work hard. He was punished in the area of work, his doings. But look at Eve. Eve was punished in the area of relationships, her belonging. She was punished, you know, the two areas closest to her heart. First, as a mother, to suffer childbirth, right, in childbirth. Second, as a wife. It says, you will clash with your husband. That's what it says, right? Your desire, Genesis 3, 16, your desire shall be contrary to your husband. That, what does that mean? That means the agenda is going to be different. They're going to be having different opinion. You're, going to not, you're not going to be for him, but you're against him. And you're not going to be complimenting each other, but rather fighting with one another. And that is the pattern we've been seeing throughout the ages, right? It's nothing new. And, you know, he shall rule over you. He's not going to uh, 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 cherish you, but he's going to rule over you. He's going to be your master, not your lover. And we've seen this happen in different cultures throughout the ages where women have been treated inferior because of this misunderstanding of the Bible. You know, sin distorted that relationship. Instead of equality, mutuality, unity, and intimacy, what God wanted, now it's competition, it's comparison, and it's about division. But you know what? We have good news. Because Jesus came to reverse that order again. Amen? Jesus is the answer. He put things right again. Back to the ideal that God created. Because if you think about it, in the New Testament, when he talks about the male and female relationship, it was extremely radical and countercultural. Look at this. In Colossians 3.19, it says, Husbands, love your wives. Love your wives and do not be harsh with them. He's saying what? You're not the master, but you are a lover. You're to lead your wife, not control your wife. 
And then in 1 Peter 3, 7, likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor. You know, for the culture that they were in, that was unheard of. They, 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 didn't, they didn't treat women that way. And women did not treat their husbands, relate to their husbands that way. But Jesus came and he said, this is how it should be. And in Ephesians 5.21, you're supposed to be submitting to one another out of reference for Christ. In a culture that was so male-dominated, that was really radical. You're supposed to submit to one another. We are to help one another. We're supporting, complementing one another. Jesus came to make things right again. So today, you know, being a child of God, thank God for that, that we are redeemed. In fact, you know, Jesus redeemed and restores everything back to the original design. We are created equal, equal, but we are different. We must recognize, respect, and celebrate the differences that we have. Embrace it. You know, I, I, I don't know whether you know, I, I, I studied architecture when I was in uni. So when I came out to work, I worked as an architect. And when I worked, I tell you, in that, uh, ministry, uh, in that industry back then, this was a oh, long time ago, maybe 20, 30 years ago, <laughs> it was very male dominated. I would go into a meeting room, I would be the only female. And it was just male dominated, you know? And it was, there was a temptation that if you wanted to be like them, you have to act tough. You have to speak louder. You have to be sharp. You have to be witty or even sarcastic, you know. You have to, you know, so you want to stand up for yourself so that you are heard. There was a temptation to do that. But, you know, often that's what happens because our mind, we want to be like them. But today I want to remind you, celebrate that we are different. Embrace that we are different. And I have seen so many people, you know, in our culture, I don't know about yours, but in China, Chinese culture, sometimes some families, they prefer boy than girl, right? I came from that kind of family. So when I was young, I always thought my brother is better. I wish I was like my brother. I wish I was a boy. I know that in many of our cultures and in the experiences that we face, we may have been hurt by maybe abusive fathers, maybe absent fathers, or maybe fathers that just didn't appreciate us being women. Or we may have come from a background where husbands have been abusive, irresponsible, uncaring, and unloving. But today, I want you to know, because we are redeemed in Jesus, in Christ, there is hope. And God wants to heal every one of us. He wants to restore that relationship again so that we can relate to one another, not in fear, not in control, not fighting with one another, but rather we can complement, we can trust, and we can love one another. Amen? And you know what, men? Women, they want and they need the men to take up that leadership role in marriage. Women need that. They want you to be leaders. You know, someone said this, the woman was not made out of man's head to rule over him, not out of his feet to be trampled upon by him, but out of his side to be equal with him, under his arm to be protected, and near his heart to be loved. So, you know, in just a moment, we're going to pray. You know, maybe we have been hurt by people that were close to us, whether it's a husband or a father, or maybe men. Yeah, maybe we need to repent of, you know, maybe some wrongful attitudes or actions. And women, we need to respect the order that was created by God, the divine order. That was the ideal order so that we can be blessed in our marriages. 
you know, it really isn't about gender. The core of the issue is sin, self-centeredness. It really isn't about gender. It's about, you know, the problem is self-centeredness. And Jesus is the answer. That's why Jesus came. He wants us to be blessed. God's intention for marriage was a good one. It was all meant to be good, remember? In creation, everything created was good. Except in Genesis 2.18, he said, not good that man should be alone. Now, he's not saying that everyone has to be married. Because we know Paul wasn't married, right? But what it means is that we are to complement and not compete with one another. We are not to fear or control or to fight, but to trust and to love one another. You know, I like this. Pastor Ed, he said this, The creation of the woman moved the man from the state of being not good. He was not good to be alone, right? Moved the man from the state of being not good to good. Hallelujah. <laughs> you know, God has given you, your husband, your spouse, your wife, to make you good, to help you grow, to help you both to be able to fulfill His calling in your life. Hallelujah. Amen. Give all glory to God. And that's what the Bible says. Don't worry about what everyone else says. Don't worry about what our culture says. Let's go back, back to the root. God's design, God's ideal. That's how God wanted us to be, how we relate to one another as men and women. Especially, you know, today we're talking about the topic of marriage. In marriage, He is the head. We support Him, we guide Him, we, 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 we empower Him so that He can fulfill His calling in His life. And as a husband, love, cherish, treasure your wife. Love her so that she and you together, we can become one. That's always a mystery, isn't it? But only in Christ is possible. Amen? Come on, let's stand. You know, what we really need is Jesus to be the center of our lives. Maybe today you're not married yet. Well, while you're not married yet, when you will be, right now, let Jesus be the center of your life. Because remember, the main problem is self-centeredness. It's not about being male or female or whatever. It's self-centeredness. So let Jesus be the center of your life. Let Jesus reign. So that when we are in a relationship, you and Him, you have Jesus as your center, you will be blessed. You will be blessed. And married couples, invite Jesus into your life, into your marriage. Hallelujah. Come on, let's worship. And then we will pray. Hallelujah. Jesus be. Jesus be the center of it all. From beginning to the end, it will always be, it's always been you, Jesus. Jesus. Let's sing it again, Jesus. Jesus be the center of my
want Him to be the center of your life right now. For those of you who are married, come on, commit your marriage to God once again and say, God, forgive us. Forgive us for not having you as the center of our marriage. Father, today I know, Jesus, you are the answer. You came to make everything right. The help that I need comes from you. So, Lord, I thank you because of Jesus, what he did on the cross. He reversed everything. He made everything right again. He rendered Satan's plans powerless. And today we receive you, Jesus, the power of the Holy Spirit to empower us every day in our lives, in our marriage, in our family, so that, Lord, your blessing can come forth. And as from today onwards, we will live according to your will. We will obey your words. We will lay ourselves down. We say, Jesus, you are first. And God, that our husband, I will support him and help him, assist him, and to be the head. Father, I thank you. And Father, I pray for the husbands that they take up that responsibility, that they are, they are happy, that they are joyful, that they are grateful, that God, you have appointed them as head and that they will take on and that you will empower them. You will guide them. I thank you, God. And for those who are married yet or are single, Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit, your love, just embrace them as who they are. Let them be able to embrace that you made them for who they are. And Father, that you have wonderful plans for their lives. And right now in this season, Father, you're just going to bless them. You're going to fill them with your power and your spirit. You're going to continue to guide them and lead them. And they will listen to you. Not the voice of the world, but the voice of the shepherd. So that they can live a life of purity. A life that is pleasing to you. And Father, we trust in your great plans in their lives. We thank you, O God. In Jesus' name I pray. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Amen.